And then today, we're going back to First and Second Samuel. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to First and Second Samuel. We're going to chapter three of First Samuel. And last week we we mentioned First and Second Samuel is really Samuel, and so we we know it as First and Second Samuel because of the length of the scrolls, the ancient scrolls. And yet, it's really one historical narrative, and it starts off with this guy named Samuel, the last of the judges, great prophet. His mama kind of praised him, praise him there, and uh, we talked about that last week. But he, the first seven chapters are really about him. And then he kind of stands in the gap between this period of judges and the period of kings, and so he, he anoints the first king of Israel in Saul, and then he anoints King David, whose line and lineage make its way to King Jesus. And so we're going to spend the whole summer talking about um, First and Second Samuel. And we're only on chapter 3 today. I'm not doing a good job um, giving you a survey of the text, and so I'm getting excited and I'm preaching too much. <laughs> on the fr- At this rate, we'll be in First and Second Samuel in next summer, and so we'll have to speed up a little bit. But we're going to be in chapter 3 today. And uh, the, the, the theme for today is also centered on prayer. Last week we talked about prayer. And so today, more of the same. If you got your Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. We'll be in verse 1. We'll pick up and we'll go through verse 10 or so, okay? It says, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. And in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place, and the lamp of God had not gone out yet. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, and where was he? He was right up next to the Ark of the Covenant, where where the Ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. And Eli said, I did not call you. Go back down and go back and lie down. And so he went and he laid down. And again the Lord called Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call you, boy. Go go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, for the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time, the Lord called Samuel. Samuel got up. He went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. I love that every single time he says the same. He says the exact same thing. Here I am. You called me. And then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. And so Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and he lied down in his place. And the Lord came and stood there calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Let me pray for us. Father, we pray today that you would do exactly what we just read, that you would speak to every single person in this room every single person watching at Moretz, God, every single person who's watching online, you have a word for us today. And I pray that uh, as we open up the scriptures, God, that you would just, through the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, just tailor what we need, the message that we need delivered. We know, you know what we brought in the room and you know what we need to hear. And so give us ears to hear. God, you've been speaking this whole time, but just allow us to listen better. And we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right, let's, so let's break it down. We'll go to verse 1, okay? So verse 1, it says this, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli, and in those days the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. And so biblically the time of the judge is kind of a bleak period for the people of God, for the Hebrew people. Last week we talked about the fact that Hannah was without child, and she couldn't conceive, and so she asked the Lord for a son and she makes this vow to God, if you give me a son, I'll dedicate him to you. I'll, I'll just return him back. I'll live with this open-handed mindset. God answers her prayer. And so here's Samuel. He's a 12-year-old serving in the tabernacle under Eli, the priest. He's, he's apprenticing under Eli. And, um, and so around four years or so, his mom, Hannah, would have brought him to the tabernacle, presented him, and he would have served up to this point. And look at verses 2 and 3. It says, One night Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see he was older, was lying down in his usual place, and the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. And so the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And so this is this lampstand in the tabernacle that they would have had uh, lit all night long. And so we know it's nighttime. Samuel's lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark 
of the covenant where the ark of God was. And so Eli, uh, if you go back to chapter 2, and you read, you do your summer reading. Come on, we're in a book club. You do your summer reading. You realize that Eli and his sons, Hophni and Phineas, we talked about them last week. Um, they have his sons, Hophni and Phineas, who are, again are a part of this priesthood. They're a part of Eli's house. Have no regard for God, is what the Bible tells us. They're at a place where they have the lineage and they have the pedigree. And yes, we come from this line and where those people were supposed to be representing God to people. And yet they have no, no regard for the things of God. So people will come to bring sacrifices to the Lord and they're supposed to have a burnt offering. And what's supposed to take place is people, you know, the priesthood would burn the offering and then whatever's left is for the priest. And yet Hophni and Phinehas, what they, they would do is they would take the fatted portion of the sacrifice for themselves. And they would begin to fight people over the fatted portion that was supposed to be meant for God. And people are like, hold up, isn't that for, isn't that for the Lord? They're like, no, it's for us. And so instead of honoring God, they begin to honor themselves. The Bible tells us that they would have sex with women who served at the, the entrance of the tabernacle and word gets out. Hey, Hophni and Phinehas are wild. You know what I mean? These dudes are evil. And so Eli rebukes them, but he really does nothing outside of just trying to bring, he really does nothing with the situation. And so God looks on the situation and says, man, this is not what I want my, my name to be about. This isn't what I want my testimony to be. And so he begins to make plans. And there's going to be a transition in this passage between Samuel and Eli. In the same way that there's going to be a transition later between Saul and David, now Samuel is becoming a man. He's 12 years old. He's stepping into this new assignment, this new call, stepping into the priesthood, stepping into becoming, again, the last judge and a great prophet of the people of Israel and, and where we find Samuel in this passage, he's, again, he's 12 years old. God bypasses the dude who's a priest, bypasses his family who has pedigree, goes straight to the 12-year-old who really, you know, wasn't, wasn't part of the family, and yet his mama prayed him into this place. And so he, he's positioned himself as close as he can get to the presence of God. The Bible tells us he's right up next to the Ark of the Covenant. Eli's right where he usually is. But Samuel is as close as he can get to the presence of God. And I think position matters when it comes to hearing God. This whole message, this whole passage is about listening, hearing God's voice. And I think one of the things that we see right out the gate is just the position that Samuel has. Man, he's close to God. He's trying to do what he can on his end. Hey, I, I want to be as close to the presence of God as I possibly can. Look at verse 4 and 5. It says, Then the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you call me. But Eli said, boy, I did not call you. Go lie, go lie back down. And so he went and he laid down. And this question, when I'm reading through this passage of Scripture, I'm just thinking, like, do I know and do you know, do we know what God sounds like? When God speaks to us, do we know what to listen for? Do you know what God sounds like? And in this passage, Samuel is so close to the presence of God and yet he can't hear him. He doesn't have ears to hear. So God's speaking to him, and I think God's speaking to you and me all the time, and we're not listening. And so proximity is part of it, but also do we just know what God sounds like? John, Jesus says this in John 10, 3. He's, he's talking about his voice and the voice of God and, and being a good shepherd. He says the gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. Jesus says, you'll know me if you know my voice, we, we have a real relationship. You're in the family of God. Hey, you're, you're one of my sheep, and here's how you know if you know my voice. That's how you know if you're following the good shepherd. And so practically the question becomes, how do I know if it's Jesus? How do I know if it's God speaking to me? How do I know if it's just not? Because I don't know if, if you have this issue or not, but sometimes uh, God sounds a lot like me. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if you have this issue. Like I'm talking to myself, it's like, that's a good idea, Lord. It's like more me than it is God. You know, like how do I know if it's me? How do I know if it's God? How do I know if it's something I ate? How do I know if my aunt's a little, a little crazy? You know, like how do I know? What, what are the filters that we determine? Is this the voice of God or is this, is this something else? And uh, 1 John 4, 1 says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether or not they're from God. And so... Samuel's in this moment where he's hearing things from God. What would the filters, you and I are the beneficiaries of context. Samuel, again, in the old covenant, doesn't have any of the new testament, doesn't have any of the new covenant, doesn't have Jesus. God has a lot to say in the person of Jesus. 
It's the greatest message ever told, and he has a lot to speak to us in the person of Jesus. We're on this side of that. We have the full canon of Scripture at our disposal, and yet here's Samuel. He's rocking with the Old Covenant. He's got a little bit of the Old Testament, but not much, so he knows the heart of God. But, man, we have so much more. We can filter, man, what is God trying to say to me? Here's some things we can filter. Does it line up with the Bible? What I'm hearing, is it is it if I'm hearing like in prayer or someone has a word of knowledge or somebody comes up to me is like, hey, I feel like God's telling me this or you just feel an impression in your spirit, like does it line up with what Scripture's already said, with the written word? I think the word of God has become, part of our issue today is the word of God has become common where we just take it for granted because, again, you and I are the bishop. You probably have four or five copies of Scripture at home, and yet we don't engage it very much. We have, like, in digital form, you have any translation you could possibly want. You have, like, I can, like, somebody from Australia can read it to me. I can mow my lawn and have, like, a theatrical version narrated in the background while I'm mowing my lawn. Like, we have it at our disposal, and yet we take it for granted. It's become common. And increasingly, we live in a day where many people have no regard for the things of God. And it's not that we can't hear God, it's that we're not listening. And so people just, they don't care. We just, we don't care. And broader culture, there's so many competing voices, a lot of agenda, a lot of opinion, a lot of information, misinformation. And so we struggle because we can't find truth. You have your truth, I have my truth, they have their truth, except that's no longer truth. Instead of, hey, the truth is outside of me, God, what do you have to say on this topic? And I'm going to submit and surrender my life over to that. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there's no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who keeps the law. And in 1 Samuel 3, it tells us, hey, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And infrequent vision. And then Proverbs reminds us, hey, there's a correlation between you aligning your life with the things of God and, and a prophetic being, like God giving you over to purpose, God giving you over to vision, God giving you over direction. When? When you do the things that God's already asked you to do. That's when, is what it says. And so you can't keep the law if you don't know what the law is. It catches me off guard sometimes in pastoral ministry, like in, in a church space, when I'm interacting with people, church family, who've been in a church space, been around the things of God, like grew up in the church, that kind of thing. And yet still it seems like there's one or two things. There's like an ignorance for the things of God, like they really don't know what God's standard is on X, Y, Z, or they just don't care. Like it's one of those two things, and it cut, catches me off guard sometimes. I'm like, wait, do you know do, do you know the law? Like, do you know what we're after, what God's command? Do you know what God's best is for your life, what, what he desires for us? And so where there's no vision, people give up. People cast off restraint. People perish. And, and it equates vision to the law of God. In other words, God's voice or word from God will never disagree with what God's already said. Jesus says in Matthew 19, somebody comes to him, Pharisees come to him, they're trying to trap him. And they said, hey, Moses gives this commentary on divorce and marriage. Uh, is, there any, is there any reason for a man to, 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 to divorce his wife? And then Jesus says what? If you know Matthew 19, he says, what does the Bible say? That's what he says in Matthew. He's like, why are you asking me? And then he gives his own commentary on that situation. He's like, hey, you know what God wants for you. You're really only asking me for, why are you asking me right now? Here's what God's already said on this topic. And so if you need vision for your life, if you lack direction, if you lack purpose and really a zeal to be used and make a difference in the lives of others, man, there's no vision apart from the word of God. You just got to start there. Just start, like if you're like, I really want to hear from God, I have never heard from God. He has a lot to say to you. 90% of what God has told me, he wrote down and I just read it, right? And maybe a higher percentage. So it's rare that I'll hear like in, in a time of prayer where it's like really clear impressions or God's giving me almost an audible, like it's real rare. There's just been like a few times in my life where God's like, this is it. And, and I had to just discern and bring all the right people into that moment and just flesh it through scripture and just be like, is this what, but majority of what God tells me, he's already just, he just wrote it down for me. He wrote it down for you. And, and so we got to start there. There's several other filters. So what does the Bible have to say? Is it, is it biblical? Is it, is it, does it, and don't take junk out of context. So, I mean, anybody could take a verse out of context and just be like, you know, like the whole counsel of scripture, the whole word of God, does it, like, what does it have to say? 
And then here's another filter. Will it make me more like Jesus? So if I go this direction, will I put on love? Will I be more of a servant? Will I look like the fruit of the Spirit? Like, will I look like faithfulness and kindness and joy? And like, will I begin to exude those things if I go this direction? Here's another one. Does godly counsel agree? Are there people in my life who I know love God, love me, love God's word, and they're in agreement with this thing. Hey, I feel like I feel like moving my family halfway across the country to take this job opportunity. Hey, I'm feeling like going to this school. Hey, I'm feeling like dating this person. Hey, I'm feeling like spending this money on this thing. Are you inviting other people into that to help you make decisions and discern, is this godly or is this my flesh? And, and, and when I say godly counsel, I don't mean people who like you. I mean godly counsel. There's a difference between your friends and godly counsel. <laughs> Hello. So godly counsel looks like, do they love God? Do they love his word? And do they love you? And so what we, what we like to do a lot of the times is uh, we, we just want people really just to agree with us. We want them just to approve of whatever direction we're already heading. We've really already made the decision and, you know, confirmation bias. We just want people to be like, so, so we go to people and we're like, hey, do you feel like I need some counsel? Do you feel like this is God? They're like, no, I don't really think that's the Lord. You're like, all right, cool. And you go over here and you're like, hey, uh, I need some counsel. Do you feel like this is God? And they're like, no, that's definitely not the Lord. You're like, shut up. And you go to another and you're like, all right, look person that always agree with me on everything. You know what I mean? You find that friend that'll agree with anybody. And, and you're just like, hey, what do you think about this situation? I'm like, yeah, I think it's good. Like, whatever. And like, All right, cool. Counsel. I got my wise counsel, right? And so you, you got you to gotta be, as a matter of fact, let me say it this way. Usually the mark of wise counsel is someone who you're a little bit like, I don't know if I want to tell them. That's how you know. That's how you're like, ah, oh, really? I got to, I got to, I got to talk to them about it. Like, that's how you know, because why? Because you don't want to be called out. And, and, and it's not about calling you out. Again, if the heart for the people who love God, who love his word and love you, it's only for you. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Come on, like God only disciplines the ones that he loves. Look at this. This is Proverbs 12, 15. It says, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Proverbs 19, 21, 20 through 21. I love this verse. It says, listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end you will be counted among the wise. Ooh, write it down. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but the Lord's purpose is the Lord's purpose that prevails. And then Proverbs 24, 5 through 6, basically all the Proverbs. But the wise prevail through great power, and those who have knowledge muster their strength. Surely you need guidance to wage war, and victory is won through many advisors. So who is your godly counsel? Who are the people that when you feel like, okay, is this God? You bring them in and you say, is this me? Is this selfishness? Am I pursuing this out of a place of flesh? Is this in alignment with God's word? Hey, would you help me see what I can't see? Find some people older than you. Hello. Find some people who have done more life, more faith, more following Jesus, some mature believers, and then bring them into that situation. And here's another one is do I have peace? So, again, God's spirit will testify to your spirit in a situation. And, and for many of us, when we're going through hard things, we're making decisions that are, we know are like the opposite of what God wants for us. There's like an anxiety, not an anxiety, but there's like, a, there's like an unsettling in our spirit with that situation. It could be with relationships. It could be with finance. It could be with opportunities vocationally, a space that you find yourself. You're hanging out with people. You're like, I know this is trash, but I'm going to keep doing it. And so, like, and so your spirit begins to be like, hey, this is not for you. Don't go there. Don't say that. Don't watch that. Don't do that. Like, and it begins to just like it becomes unsettling. Do you have a peace because you know kind of you're in that sweet spot when it aligns with Scripture, godly counsel agrees, and you just have a peace set in. I think about when Brooke and I, we stepped out to plant a church, and the, the sending church, the church that sent us to start, we were like praying about where God wanted to send us. And, and if you know the backstory, like I was really thinking Raleigh-Durham or Houston. That's what I was thinking. A lot of people moving to Raleigh-Durham, even more people moving to Houston, 
And, and there was so many people moving that churches couldn't keep up with the rate of growth for the city. And I was like, a big dummy could plant a church and people just come. And those people need a place to worship, you know what I mean? So I'm like, hey, this would be great. I'm only going to work in the southeast. Probably, your boy's probably not going to do well in Portland, you know what I'm saying? So I probably don't need to do that. And so somewhere in the southeast. And then Brooke was like, San Diego, Lord, send us to San Diego. Or somewhere, you know, somewhere tropical. And, and God was like, Hickory. And we were like, okay. And so, like, so, so literally, we, sp- we didn't take it off the table. We prayed through it in this season. We're already living in the area. But when we felt direction from God, when we prayed, when we brought wise counsel in, and when we went through this whole process, peace. Not only peace, but supernatural love for the region, for the people, for, for God's assignment. So do I have peace? And the best way to determine whether or not it's God is to begin to develop a relationship to the point that there is intimacy. So when God speaks, you know him because you know his voice. You know what he would say because you've already spent time reading what he's already said. You know what Jesus would do because you've already learned about the life, the teaching, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. You spend time with others who are pursuing Jesus and following him. You begin to figure out the types of things that mature believers affirm, the types of things that mature believers pursue, the types of things that mature believers avoid. And you go, I should probably do that. That's probably what I should do if I want to be like Jesus. And so in other words, you begin to recognize God's voice. Um, I have a relatively new iPhone uh, because I had this light phone before. You probably, If you've been around, you know I had this, this light phone. It was a little analog phone, real simple. It's a dumb phone, essentially, is what it is. It's so good, redeems a lot of time, no screen time. Also, bad in the sense that I never used it. Like, like people would text me, and I would never text them back, or people would call me. I didn't even know where the phone was. You know, it's like it totally removed my desire for phone entirely. And so, uh, really great, but also not probably the best way to steward communication with people and leadership. So I was like, I probably need to come up with a different plan. And so still have it, love it, but got me an iPhone. Now, my contacts didn't transfer. So I don't know if you've ever had this moment where you get the new phone, contacts don't fully transfer, somebody texts you. And they don't text you with any kind of salutation, any kind of like, hey, it's been a long time. They, they just pick up where they left off. The last conversation you had, it feels like, oh, they know me, and I don't know whose number this is. And so you have a decision to make. Somebody calls you, they cold call you, and you're like stressed out. You're like, I don't know whose number this is. It doesn't even give you the maybe. You know how sometimes it gives you the maybe? You're like, thank God for the maybe. That's brilliant. But like sometimes it doesn't even give you the maybe and you're stressed out and you have a decision to make. Am I going to answer and fake it and be like, hey, what y'all doing? How's it going? Like, and just pretend like you, just to give enough time to hear their voice and be like, yeah. Like I've done that before and it just, it doesn't work well. Or own the moment and be like, I have no idea who you are. Like I have no idea who's calling me right now. And so uh, I think that's, that's kind of, that's what we're learning in this passage of Scripture. There's some people in your life that when they call you, there's so much intimacy there. You don't need the maybe. You don't need the contact. You don't even have to look at your phone. You can just hear their voice. Like if Brooke calls me, I know it's Brooke. If my dad calls me, I know it's my dad. Why? Because we've spent time. Because we've talked. Because I know their voice. Same thing for the things of God. If you want to know his voice, spend some time talking to him and watch what happens. You begin to develop, oh, I know this is the Lord. Look at verses 6 and 7. It says, again, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. My son, Eli, said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. You know, sometimes... Uh, when you have to call people on the phone, and it might be a work thing, or somebody asked you to make that call, and it feels like an obligation. You're not really wanting to talk to the person. You're praying to God, it goes to the voicemail. Have you ever had that moment in your life, right? You're just calling them, and you're, you just want to say, I, yeah, I called them. I didn't get them, and you know, you know, we've all had that moment. Uh, so there's that moment. Then there's also the moment, a lot of times it's with people who are closest to you. When you don't get them, you will keep calling them. Right? So there's the people that you don't really want to get in contact with. And then there's the people that you desperately want to get in contact with. My wife leaves her phone on Do Not Disturb. Are there any Do Not Disturb people in the room? Come on. Just, okay, cool. All right, well, I'll judge you secretly, right? So it's like she leaves her phone on Do Not Disturb. It's great. She's very present. 
She's the best listener. She's serving whoever she's in front of. You cannot get in touch with her. And so, like, I'll, I will call her sometimes. And there's one time I called 23 times. Some of y'all are like, he's a psycho. I was trying to prove my point, okay? So it's like, I, I'm like, I'm just trying to get out in front of her. Hey, hey, you know, I'm just trying to get her attention because I had something really important to say. And some of us, when we think about our relationship with God, we think God called me one time and I missed it, and he was so glad I missed it. What you need to know is God has been calling you, and he's going to keep calling you. He's going to keep calling you. Hey, listen, he called you before. You weren't listening. You didn't hear it, and he's just going to keep calling you. God loves you. He is relentless. He is in pursuit of you. What got you here is God is calling you. And so this is what Samuel experiences. You just need to know this is the love that God has for us. He's after us, and he desires to be in relationship with us. He wants more from us. And you might feel like somehow you're disqualified from a moment like the one that Samuel has because of your background, because of your past, because of your pedigree. You're just thinking, that's cool for Samuel, but, like, whatever. Like, I'm just an average. And yet, overwhelmingly in Scripture, God does not call the qualified. God calls people just like me and you to do impossible, miraculous, crazy works in and through them. And the posture that Samuel has ought to be the same posture that you and I have. Here I am. Like, I love that. I love that Samuel's just, and he thinks it's Eli. He don't even know it's God, but he's like, here I am. Here I am. And, and that's the posture that we should have. You know what's so crazy if you read your Bible over and over again in the Old Testament, just in the Old Testament, you have like Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah, Samuel, all of these people, what they say when they're called is, really? Out of everybody that you had to choose from, really? And then their posture is, here I am. Like, do, if you're gonna do your work, do your work through me. Only you can do it. And so you just need to know that God calls again. He speaks again. And I'm just thinking about, I love God's grace. How many times has God called me on a thing and I did not pick up and I didn't know it was him or I didn't, I just didn't care. And yet he just kept calling. Oh, I love that we serve a God who's the God of the second call and the third call and the fourth call come all the way to 23, whatever it takes to get in front of you. Like God, he, he's a God of grace. He never stops speaking. And Sam, Samuel has served his, his life now from the age of around four probably to the age of 12 in a tabernacle space. He knows about the things of God. Samuel knows about religious responsibilities and rituals. He's lit that light. Come on, he lights that lamp every day. He baked him some shoe bread. You know, he's just walking around behind Eli. He knows what to say, knows what not to say, knows what to do, those types of things. Again, ritual and religion. And yet the passage tells us he does not know the Lord. It says this. It says, the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. Samuel did not know the Lord. There's a difference between knowing things about God and knowing God. And so knowing things about God, he had already had, but he had never heard the voice of the Lord. And that, the Bible tells us, is the way to distinguish, do I know things about God? Am I religious in my expression? Am I going through the ritual? Am I doing things just because this is just what we do? Or do I have a real relationship with God? That word know is so important. It's the first part of our vision as a church. Our mission is to help people know God, not know things about him. You got plenty of information. Know him. We, we, we want to, to get you to a place where God speaks and you, you experience real encounter, real breakthrough. And this is the first time that he's hearing God. And so the, the question all of us should be asking is, do I know things about him or do I know him? Do, is there a real relationship there? Look at verse 8 and 9. It says this, a third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and he went to Eli and he said, here I am. You called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy, not Samuel. Eli realized the Lord was calling the boy. And so Eli told Samuel, hey, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And Samuel does what he asks. Who do you let speak into your life? Who is it that's in your life right now that you listen to? 
Again, back to wise counsel. Who are the people that you invite in? Whatever God's going to speak into your life, it's going to come in the context of relationships. The moments that I've experienced the most growth in my own walk with Jesus have been because of the people who are around me in that moment. Parents, my wife, mentors, people who love me enough to just care for me, even when, even when I didn't know the right decision or the right approach to make or the right place to go, and they're praying for me, interceding for me, asking me, getting in my business in the right way. And so I love it. Eli's in this place where he, he's the one that realized God's talking to Samuel, and he gives him direction. And what's wild is that the count, like what God speaks, if you read this passage, what God speaks to Eli, or excuse me, what God speaks to Samuel is not good for Eli and his family. And yet, Eli is hungry to hear from God. He's been there before. Like, he's a priest, he's been there and and encountered God's presence before, and he's like, hey, here's what you need to do in this moment. No one good and well, Hophni and Phinehas have just like ruined a thing. And he's like, hey, I just, we still need to hear from God. We still need direction from God. We wanna hear directly from him. And so you need some people in your life who've been there before. You need some people in your life, again, mature believers, someone that you can walk alongside of, someone that's been further than you. You need some, everybody needs mentors, man. Everybody needs coaches. Everybody needs some people, a mark, a minister. This is what Titus 2 talks about. Hey, you need some people further along in the faith so that you can model your life after them. It's not that they're Jesus. It's just sometimes, man, the, the most helpful thing is to put some flesh on it and see faithfulness walked out in the lives of the people that are closest to you. That's what you need. Um, I think about the Olympics. It's Olympic season, right? And, uh, I, and I don't know if all y'all into Olympics or whatever, but summer this summer is, is Olympic season. And I used to nerd out on Olympics prior to streaming and all the things, you know what I mean? I don't even know or care anymore. But, but like back in the day, I used to watch it. And the thing that used to blow me away is you have these like world-class athletes they're the best at what they do in the world. And so, they, but they finish the routine, they finish the trial run, they finish the race. Hey, whatever qualifying round to kind of get them to medal place. And, and what is the first thing that they do when they finish? They walk straight over to the coach and they say, all right, tell me everything that I need to know to get better. I was just 9.4. Everybody was cheering. It can get better. I'm after gold. It can get better. Like this approach of like, I, need, I want you to speak into my life. I need you. You have a better vantage point than I do. I'm doing the routine. You could see me. Your third, you've also been here before. You've won like three gold or whatever with the Russians or what. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up right now. But I'm just saying, like the idea is you need people further along than you are to walk alongside of you. We all need Eli's in our lives. And listen, if you're an Eli, you need a Samuel. Y'all need somebody further along than you in your faith. You always need somebody maybe that's new to the faith or who hold no context or just, you know, just maybe don't have as much maturity in Christ as you do to just, and it's not like you're better than them. Your whole job is to serve people in Christ's likeness. This is for your marriage, for your family, with your kids, for coworkers, whatever. The whole job is to help each other grow up in Jesus. That's the whole job. And the way, the vehicle that we do this as a church family, we talk about finding freedom. Groups is really the only way to do this. And a lot of people don't like the programming side of it or, or like the, 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 the necessary vehicle that we use. But you already group. You already community. You already spend time with a handful of people. But the question is, are you consistently spending time with people who grow your faith and affection for Jesus? Are you spending time with people who actually are helping your soul or are you just spending time with people? So put some purpose on it. The whole idea is all of us have to spend time with people who are further along than us, and all of us have to pour out, hey, here's what Christ has done in my life. And my challenge to you, like, so if you're new to our church family, there's some groups that are made available over the course of the summer, over a, a six-week period. Some of you have been coming. You're like, I don't know anybody by name. I need to get connected to some people. Join a group. But also for the fall, for our church family, if you're mature in Christ, if you're a leader and you know who you are, and you have to tell you, if you're a leader, If you're a leader and you love Jesus, in the fall, go ahead and prepare your heart and your soul and your mind to lead people. Be an Eli to somebody. Bring somebody in around your dining room table, in a coffee shop, whatever the place may be. Because in order for this thing to really scale and go the way that God wants it, all of us take our portion, our assignment. If the Holy Spirit's like, hey, there's some people in your life right now in your span of care that I desperately need you to lead spiritually. And it could just take like literally just a weekly check-in, time of prayer, a devotional, like whatever it looks like. 
That's what we have to run at as a church family. You and I need people in our lives who are listening for us. You need some people to grow alongside and pursue Christ together. And I, I do, and I know you do as well, stand on the shoulders of other people's faith. I'm only where I am because of the faith of others, and this is what God's called us to as the church. So if you're a leader, lean in and pray about it and, and then begin to step into that assignment, that call that God has on your life. Look at verse 9. He says, therefore, Eli says to Samuel, go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went, and he laid down in his place. And we started off this whole conversation about uh, where Samuel was. He's close to the Ark of the Covenant. I love this, com- this whole idea. So now Eli's giving him counsel. Hey, get, get close to God. Like, get close to the presence of God. Go back where you were. He says, lie down. And then when God calls, say, hey, it's your servant. There's three things I see in this part of the passage. One, there's proximity, there's rest, and there's humility. So if you're going to be in position to hear from God, it's going to take, usually it's going to take these things. Proximity, rest, and humility. What does proximity look like? It looks like turning down the noise. It looks like turning off the news. It looks like turning off the stuff that you know is just like poison for your soul. It looks like just drawing close to the things of God. It looks like maybe instead of listening to that, I listen to worship music or I don't listen to anything and I just sit in silence and solitude. It looks like, man, I need a space dedicated for me to engage the things of God. I need a quiet time. I need to just spend some time in conversation with him. I need to, what, whatever it is that draws you close to God. And I know some of you are like, I just want to go on a walk in nature. Whatever it is that gets you close, whatever it is that gets you there, do more of it. Get closer. And that includes what you're doing in a space like this. Again, gathering on Sundays is a big part of that, but there's so much more every single week, some disciplines that we can build so that we're close, so that we can hear what God has to say. The other one is rest. The time where I've heard God the most, given the most direction, the most vision, is in a season of Sabbath. It was on a day off. God's like, cool, you done being busy? Awesome, let me talk to you. And I'm like, dang, that, would, that is like I, way more fruitful than what I was doing. He's like, I know, right? It's like, you're working real hard and doing nothing. Like, if you would just listen to me, like I'd give you direction, I'd give you vision, I'd give you a word, and it often comes from a place of Sabbath. That needs to, you, you need a daily space of rest. Some of you think way too highly about um, you know, what you bring to the table vocationally or what you bring to the table in your business or wherever it is you work. Like, you're special, okay? But, like, also, just take a break. Like, just take a break, hear from God on the front of the day, preferably, but we just need that rhythm of just sitting and just hearing and listening and praying and reflecting. You need it daily. You need it weekly. This is the reason why we have a weekend, P.S. Jewish Sabbath on Saturday Christian Sabbath on Sunday, some of y'all's minds blown right now. You're like, dude, I did not know. Like, so that's the reason why we do that. But you just need a day where you pull away from all the things that are just pulling at you, where you just re- reflect and you rest and you enjoy family and friends. You eat good food and you sleep in a little bit. Come on, you eat some pancakes. Come on. Like whatever the thing is, you just you need you need to reset and rest. You need to enjoy God's presence. And then you need humility. Hey, when he speaks, when he speaks, I want you to say this. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And there's this just posture of humility that is attached to this moment. And I love it because that's what prayer is. Prayer is a posture of humility that requires proximity, that requires rest, that requires humility. Prayer is like, I can't do it. And, and, and you can pre-decide that you can't do it. You don't have to wait till your world falls apart. You can daily pre-decide there is no way for me to do all the things that God's called me to do in the ways that he's called me to do it outside of my dependence on him. I need him to speak. I need him to give direction. I need him to equip. I need him to strengthen. I need him to edify. I need him to do everything that he does. And guess how he does it? With his word. And so he'll speak to you if we get close, if we rest, if we have humility. And a humble heart gives us fresh ears it's it's prepared soil for the word of God what he wants to sow in your life comes about because of a posture of surrender and a posture of humility watch what happens when we do he speaks to Samuel verses 10 and 11 and the Lord came and stood calling 
as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Oh, I'm so glad he comes, he circles back. He keeps calling. Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. And then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I'm about to do a new thing in Israel. Can you imagine? He's 12. I'm looking, at, I'm looking at some young people in the room and I'm just thinking, man, you don't have to wait until you're 45 to be used by God. And, and guess what? The opposite is true. You've never like outrun like God's call in your life, the purposes of God. You're never like too old, too young, too uneducated, too overeducated. Economy doesn't matter. Ethnicity doesn't matter. None of the things that we... we the, the pedigree, none of that kind of stuff. What matters is, am I surrendered? Here I am. Like, is that our posture? And so he has that posture, and God speaks. He says, I'm doing a new thing. Can I tell you that I believe that the Spirit of God, not just here at Soma, but just in general in these days, is doing a new thing? I think you being here, I think people leaning in, I think people getting excited about their faith, not just at our church, but just churches around the nation. I think God is doing a new thing. And I think he desires that his spirit will be poured out. I think he desires that you would listen, that you would hear, have ears to hear, and he'd speak to you. He'd change everything when you hear him. And you actually obey the things that he's asking you to do. It changes everything. It changed the life of Samuel so much. So if you look at verse 19, look what happens. As Samuel grew, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. None of his words return void. Why? Because God's, why? Because the Lord's with him. Not because Samuel's smart. Because God was with him and he was listening. God would use him and none of his words would fall to the ground. And so this is our desire to be, as a church family, as followers of Jesus, people who listen, who hear, get direction from God. And when we get direction from him and hear from him, it changes everything. Amen. Let's pray together.